So I've been sharing interesting articles that I find on the Patreon page for this podcast, articles that catch my attention and keep me thinking for a very long time after I read them. And one article of this kind that I posted just the other day revolved around the burgeoning solar panel industry in the United States, particularly rooftop solar, which is different in many respects from the commercial scale solar installations that can take up acres of land and other solar based installations that don't even use solar panels, but instead rely on things like mirrors to focus sunlight on a central tower where water is heated and then steam is produced to create energy, much like some of the older fashioned styles of power plants using other types of heating power. But rooftop solar has been growing incredibly quickly and has in fact defied most expert opinions almost every year for about a decade, growing faster than even their most optimistic projections. And this has obviously been worrying for a lot of other industries. I mentioned in a past episode about the coal industry, how the players in that particular space, both the corporations who operate the mines and the power plants, but also the workers on the ground in those mines, working in those plants, are up in arms about this new barbarian at the gate. But this article that I read, which I'll link to in the show notes, focuses on another conflict that wasn't immediately evident to me. The rivalry between the rooftop solar industry and the utility companies that traditionally divvy out energy to homes and businesses. Now when you think about it, this actually makes a whole lot of sense. Utility companies serve as the arteries between power generators, between coal plants and gas plants and even great big solar arrays, and the homes and businesses that use the energy that these power plants produce. When you start installing rooftop solar panels on homes and businesses, however, you find yourself in a situation where these consumers of electricity begin buying less wattage from these power plants because they're generating their own, which in turn means that arterial utility infrastructure is less necessary for them. Where things begin to get really complicated is when you notice that in some parts of the country, I'm talking about the U.S. in particular here, the sun is shining and generating solar power consistently enough to produce more energy than these homes and businesses actually consume. And in some states, these home and business owners can then sell their excess energy back to the grid, back to the utility companies. And on its face, this seems wonderful. There are times when energy resources are strained and the prices skyrocket. This would seem like an excellent way to reduce pressure on the grid, while also allowing some home and business owners to reduce their utility costs by making an upfront investment in solar panels. But one of the reasons that solar has experienced such a boom, up to 900% growth by some estimates, in these sunny regions, is a practice called net metering. Net metering is an incentive provided by the government to solar panel owners that essentially says they can sell excess energy back to the grid for the same price they would usually pay for that energy. And this has created a situation in which many, and again increasingly many, home and business owners are able to not just reduce their own consumption from the grid, but are actually making money from it. And part of what you're paying for when you pay for energy from the grid is not just energy, but the maintenance costs on that infrastructure, on the cables and the poles and the labor that's required to bury various components and to make repairs, on the converters and other complicated things that ensure power gets from point A to point B without killing anyone or blowing anyone up. Now, in an ideal world, ideal in my mind anyway, the utility companies would operate as kind of an optimizing intermediary in all things power related. They would focus on putting the smart in smart grid, allowing people to more easily both take and provide energy to the broader grid, and would ensure that the markets that would no doubt pop up between regions from state to state, city to city, country to country, 
operated efficiently. When we have a lot of power coming from a lot of different sources, very much including power plants, but also individual homes and all the businesses that are beginning to cover their vast swaths of warehouses with solar panels, and all the way down to the scale of the individuals who have smaller wind turbines hooked up outside their RVs, then the entire system is more resilient. It's more capable of surviving a catastrophe. And like any ecosystem, that diversity of production methods ensures the grid is healthier and less easily successfully attacked or crippled by natural forces. But we're not in an ideal world. So at the moment, what this scenario, which could in time lead to a more ideal, resilient energy grid, looks like to many people in the utilities sector is the harbinger of death for the way things are. They are accustomed to running an organization that's in charge of all the pieces of the puzzle and which is partially funded by the cost of energy paid by consumers. They do not have an operational model for what happens when a significant portion of their customer base and income disappears. So what the utility companies are doing is ganging up under the header of an interest group called the Edison Electrical Institute and selling a storyline to help prevent what they see as their demise. And they're not wrong from some perspectives. I don't think they're right, but the way things are going, they would absolutely have to change their shape and purpose. So from the standpoint of an incumbent entity, it makes sense that they would see this type of change as doom. But in trying to counter this change, their main target is not the relatively defensible solar industry itself, but rather the incentives that governments are providing to home and business owners who want to buy rooftop solar panels. Namely, they are looking to kill off net metering, the incentive that allows them to sell energy back to the grid at retail price. This may seem like a small thing, but if you do the math, it's actually kind of a big deal. Solar panels are getting cheaper each year, but they're still not attainable by most people. And net metering is a big selling point for many because it means they're able to, for example, earn back the cost of installing those solar panels through the savings that they make on their energy bill in five years instead of 15 years. For people who are not just independently wealthy and for businesses who are paying attention to every fraction of a cent that they spend, that difference is pretty monumental. And removing something like net metering could stop the growth of the rooftop solar panel industry in its tracks. What I want to talk about today is not the solar industry, but incentives like net metering, these seemingly tiny but actually immensely important and influential line items that can determine the fates of entire industries and can shape the direction of entire populations without us even realizing it. You are listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. I'm fortunate to have a couple different sponsors for each episode, which is really wonderful. It gives me a way to get paid for the work that I do for this podcast. But long term, I would love to make it a completely listener-supported show. For something like that to work, it means that there has to be a contribution model that is well-populated enough that I can continue to do it to make the time to produce this show consistently while also being able to pay the rent. Now, I've used a couple different models for this since I started it a little over a year ago. I still do take contributions through Venmo and through PayPal and a few other options like that. You can find all of those options at letsnotethings.com if you click on the contribute page. But I've also recently started up a Patreon page, which seems like a really good way to create a consistent amount of revenue coming in each month for this show. And I had somebody recently comment over there that they're not super concerned about the bonuses that are offered over there. You do, if you contribute, get an ad-free version of the show, and you get a few other bonuses depending on which level you sign up for. But they said that they weren't particularly interested in that so much as being able to, one, contribute to a podcast that they enjoy, and two, being able to 
discuss the various episodes and other articles and such that I post over there with other people who are interested in such things. And so rather than having any other sponsor messages today, I'm just going to say, if you are interested in, one, helping to support the show and its continued existence and potentially expansion, but two, you also want to discuss the topics that you hear about here, if you want to get into that on a much deeper level with a bunch of people who are interested in doing the same, consider popping by patreon.com slash let's know things. And if you sign up, you'll find that it's really easy to set up a consistent monthly contribution of however much you like. There are some set tiers there that tell you the different benefits that you get, but you can do as much or as little as you like. But any amount that you contribute gives you access to all of the discussions that are happening over on that website. And we do discuss every individual episode, and I post articles each week as well for additional discussion. So if that sounds at all interesting to you, please do stop by patreon.com slash let's know things. A huge thank you to everyone who has already helped support the show in any way, shape, or form, whether that means leaving a review, telling your friends about it, posting about it on social media, contributing monetarily in some way. That means a whole lot to me, so thank you very much. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I want to start with today comes from the New York Times, and it's entitled, Science Needs a Solution for the Temptation of Positive Results. This article addresses an issue that's been rearing its head in many fields of science over the past several years, that of non-replicable experimental results. Though it would probably be more accurate to say that this is an issue that's been more prominent of late more evident lately, because some elements of the scientific world have become more careful and cautious than they have been in the past, which is a good thing. And corporations in particular, including one called Amgen, which is a biotechnology company that's discussed in this article, that recently attempted to replicate 53 landmark studies that seemed to argue in favor of new approaches for treating cancer using existing and novel molecules, They've become trepidatious about the results upon which they've come to rely, which makes a whole lot of sense if you think about it. Many of these corporations, including Amgen, have tangible monetary stakes in whether or not the data they're using is accurate. If Amgen were to spend billions of dollars developing cancer treatments based on false or flimsy data, that would be wasted money. And as it turned out, their efforts to replicate those 53 studies resulted in an 11% success rate, which is to say that they tried to replicate the studies to see if they would get the same results as the original researchers, and they only did so 11% of the time. Which is not good. Reproducibility is a key principle of the scientific process. It's what helps us sort interesting anecdote from scientific reality. It may be that a clear-headed scientist notices something interesting in a lab and has tons of equipment measuring what's happening and there's recorded video evidence and there are just gobs of indications that something remarkable is happening. But then in the aftermath, no one else is ever able to replicate that result, that same event. And that's important because no matter how true something seems to be to one individual or one group of people, if we cannot replicate it, that tells us something, right? It tells us that we don't understand what's happening or what happened the way that we thought we did. We reproduce research because if we don't, anyone could just say something like, I prayed for rain and it happened. And we might come to think that that's how the world works, that rain or whatever else just arrives on request. And this is actually how we came to see and understand the world for much of human history. These yarns were sometimes called old wives' tales because they were spread from generation to generation, from village to village, by rumor. This is why we thought that spitting on wounds would heal them, and why we thought that bloodletting was a good cure for just about any ailment, and why we believed that gods brought the rain. It wasn't that these people were stupid or had any ill intent. They were just ignorant about the forces that they were trying to figure out. 
And when we're exposed to something new, we see it through the lens of our existing worldview. So if we believe that gods control the elements, of course we're going to assume that they are the force behind the rain. It's unlikely that, lacking knowledge of modern climate science, someone in the Bronze Age would spontaneously come up with things like evaporation and low-pressure systems and the like to explain why the fields are flooding this year. Reproduction of research is part of what separates science from anecdote and is part of how anecdote can, in some cases, become science. Anecdote means that you or someone else observed something. That's it. Science is what happens when we test that observation to figure out if what we thought happened actually happened and to suss out the mechanism behind what happened. So if you noticed that rain occurred when you prayed for it and it always seemed to work that way for you, reproducing that observation might lead us to discover that you always happened to pray for rain right as the local air was reaching the breaking point of its relative humidity, and right as it was becoming saturated enough to form rain clouds. The right time of day, the right weather patterns, the right circumstances for rain. This could, in turn, teach us things about evaporation and the water cycle, and moisture being swept upward due to convection, and numerous other things that we didn't know before. Anecdote approached from the right angle, with the right attitude and intentions, can lead to new discoveries. On the other hand, we could also attempt to replicate this act and find that it is pure hokum. Cognitive biases often come into play when we feel that we're noticing patterns, and it may be that you remembered the instances when your prayer seemed to result in rain, but immediately forgot the times when it didn't work. There's nothing remarkable about that, so you simply discarded it as useless data. It wasn't worth mentioning or remembering. It was a non-event. Lacking the rigor of the scientific process, anecdote often falls prey to things like this, to flawed memories, to biases, to a reshaping of events to fit our prejudices, and numerous other factors that science helps us weed out. Such observations can lead to good science, but anecdote alone simply noticing something, experiencing something, is not enough. It is too susceptible to human error. So anecdotal observation is not useless, but it is not the final step in the process either. If you ever find yourself believing that your personal experience trumps legit research and data collecting, remember that it's not an insult to you or your memory or your intelligence to assume that you may be mistaken for a multitude of reasons. To err in this way is very, very human. Now that said, even after we've taken a look at these observations and run them through a real-deal scientific study, complete with controls and independent and dependent variables, and as many safeguards against outside contamination as possible, those studies are still suspect. They're still liable to change. In some cases, this is because the people doing the studies might have their own agendas, but far more likely is the possibility that not all outside variables were accounted for, and some unmeasured variance may have worked its way into the results. Good scientists can control for a lot of things, but they are not infallible. If we're testing a drug, and a study seems to show that this drug cures cancer, that's good reason to be excited about the drug's potential. But more studies must be conducted beyond that single study, because there's a chance that something else could have been responsible for the positive results other than just the drug. Maybe some of the test subjects were genetically predisposed to be resistant to that particular type of cancer. Maybe the diets of the test subjects were inconsistent, and it was actually something that they were eating that accounted for the differences. Maybe the subjects' environments, where they lived, who they lived with, the work that they did, their lifestyles or workout routines or other drugs they were taking, could have influenced the results. Testing and retesting and retesting again allows researchers to slice and dice the issue until they are as certain as they can be that they know what is causing what, and as a result, that the drugs they are making, or the RAIN science that they are teaching, is as accurate as possible that what they are doing is science, not just observation-based speculation. This is why the issue of reproducibility in science is so worrying. When research is conducted and results are derived, 
very often those results are built upon by the next layer of scientific development. Sometimes this means medicines or medical procedures are developed, at which point the aforementioned issues could arise, with drug companies shoveling billions of dollars into cures that don't work, if the foundational studies have errors built into them that were not caught. But even more pernicious are the discoveries that are not true and which are not immediately acted upon in tangible ways. So rather than being tested more thoroughly by businesses that have turned the science into technology, they instead become part of our broad base of scientific knowledge. Research papers do not exist inside a vacuum. They are cited and used as the basis for new research. This means that a sufficiently popular or interesting scientific result could fork off into hundreds of new studies, all of which make assumptions based on that new fact we seem to know, and which as a result taints all those new studies, if it turns out to not be as true as the original flawed study led us to believe. This happened in the case of those 53 studies that were retested by Amgen a few years back. 21 of those 53 studies were published in the most popular scientific journals and were then cited an average of 231 times apiece. Remember in school when you had to cite your sources in a bibliography, showing where your information came from? In many cases, your entire argument was predicated on information that someone else provided, and those citations showed that you'd done your homework. But imagine that one of those sources gave you a wrong date. They said the United States became a country in 1786 instead of 1776. This incorrect data could muck up your entire argument, or it could sit idly, tucked amongst other correct data, innocuous and unmentioned, except that it would perhaps in the future be cited again and again in other papers, in other bibliographies, spreading that incorrect bit of data even further. That is what's happened here. This incorrect data, these false findings, were spread far and wide. They were used in numerous follow-up papers and studies, and as a result, those derivative papers and studies must also be called into question. The ripple effect of any piece of bad data in the scientific community can be crippling because of how interconnected everything is. Now, it should be said that this weakness is actually part of what makes the scientific community so strong as well. It's a self-correcting process, and that these things are being noticed, that these flaws are being written about, if perhaps later than most people would wish, is a good thing, and that the community is up in arms about it, doing its best to figure out what went wrong, how to correct the damage that was done, and how to prevent it from happening again in the future. That's laudable. It's an embarrassment, but not one that they are ignoring to save their reputation. Part of the practice of science is correcting falsehoods, and this is a big part of why it's far more trustworthy than other perspectives through which one might view the world, which never or seldom change regardless of what new data becomes available. But this issue is still an issue, and to a large degree, it can be tied back to a misalignment of incentives within the scientific establishment. A quote from that New York Times article does a good job of explaining what I mean by that. Quote, the research environment and its incentives compound the problem. Academics are rewarded professionally when they publish in a high-profile journal. Those journals are more likely to publish new and exciting work. That's what funders want as well. This means there is an incentive, barely hidden, to achieve new and exciting results in experiments. Some researchers may be tempted to make sure that they achieve new and exciting results. This is fraud. As much as we want to believe it never happens, it does. Clearly, fabricated results are not going to be replicable in follow-up experiments. But fraud is rare. What happens far more often is much more subtle. Scientists are more likely to try to publish positive results than negative ones. They are driven to conduct experiments in such a way as to make it more likely to achieve positive results. They sometimes measure many outcomes and report only the ones that showed bigger results. Sometimes they change things just enough to get a crucial measure of probability, the p-value, down to 0.05 and claim significance. This is known as p-hacking. How we report on studies can also be a problem. Even some studies reported on by newspapers, like this one, fail to hold up as we might hope. 
end quote. There are a couple of interesting points there. The first is that scientists themselves are incentivized to do big, impressive, newsworthy research. This doesn't mean that they'll resort to fraud to make it happen. The vast majority of scientists are honest agents when it comes to this kind of thing. But might some be tempted to frame their research in what could be construed as dishonest ways? To put out press releases about some small facet of the study, bolstering its perceived importance? To get their name out there? To increase the size of future research grants? To forward the study of a field that they care about? Maybe. It certainly happens. And the shape of the scientific publication world and its relationship with the press, because these journals also want to outshine their competitors by publishing the most sensational work, that doesn't help. The other point is that the press itself plays a huge role in the inflating of some research and the deflating of other, less headline-worthy discoveries. Another quote from that article, quote, this year, a study looked at how newspapers reported on research that associated a risk factor with a disease, both lifestyle risks and biological risks. For initial studies, newspapers didn't report on any null findings, meaning those that had results without expected outcomes. They rarely reported null findings, even when they were confirmed in subsequent work. Fewer than half of the significant findings reported on by newspapers were later backed by other studies and meta-analyses. Most concerning, while 234 articles reported on initial studies that were later shown to be questionable, only four articles followed up and covered the refutations. Often, the refutations are published in lower-profile journals, so it's possible that reporters are less likely to know about them. Journal editors may be as complicit as newspaper editors." End quote. At multiple levels, then, there are incentives to produce results that dazzle, publish those results to amplify the reputation of a scientific journal, and then report on the articles in those journals to a public that in many cases lacks the proper scientific background to understand and put it all into correct context. So we, on the receiving end of all of this, see only a small, generally positive selection of research data and we also receive that small sliver of data in ways that amplify the surprising, disconcerting, or unusual, rather than that which supports existing frameworks and knowledge, or shows the flaws in past research that was sensationally published. So in short, we receive the clickbait versions of science, and are unlikely to be made aware of new information that supports existing scientific knowledge. At each step of the process, the people involved are not bad people. They're not intentionally muddling science for the masses, and they're not intentionally poisoning the well of our collective scientific knowledge. But these small incentives add up, and the implication that all of them feel, I think, is that if they don't play ball in small ways, they will find themselves unable to participate in the fields that they care about. They'll be unable to conduct research that they believe is important. They'll be unable to publish work that the scientific world needs to see. They'll be unable to educate the public, little by little, as to what's happening in the labs and research facilities around the world. Each of these entities are doing what makes sense to them, and that sense is shaped by incentives. So what is an incentive? The definition is actually somewhat dependent on what field we're talking about, but at its most basic level, an incentive is just a motivating factor to get someone to do something. A parent who threatens to punish their child if that child continues to draw on their bedroom wall is leveraging an incentive to adjust the behavior of their artistic but destructive child. Don't do that and you will not be punished. This could be said to be a type of coercive incentive, an incentive that's backed by the threat of force if the thing that you're trying to motivate someone to do is not done. Military intimidation between countries falls into this same category, as does a bouncer at a bar who simply, by being present, incentivizes customers to behave themselves. There are also moral incentives which make use of social standing or a person's internalized sense of self to nudge them toward the thing that you want them to do. Moral incentives are used by religious organizations to encourage certain behaviors in their flock. 
There's generally no threat of violence if you fail to say your weekly allotment of Hail Marys, but you still feel the necessity to do so nonetheless. They're also used by governments to keep their people behaving the way a quote-unquote good American or quote-unquote patriotic Frenchman should act. And yes, this type of incentive is even sometimes used by parents who might convince their children to behave in a certain way by implying that if they do not, they will be bad. A softer form of incentive is sometimes called a natural incentive or intrinsic motivation. This is usually a more internal process, the result of curiosity or acting on an emotion. You might feel incentivized to get revenge, for instance, because you feel that it would be satisfying. Or you might feel compelled to climb over that mountain to see what's on the other side, despite all the risks associated with such an act. The scope of this type of incentive is quite broad, but it's also the motivating factor, at least in part, of a huge percentage of what we do each day, even if we might rationally justify them otherwise later. Then finally, there are financial incentives, sometimes called remunerative incentives. While natural incentives might shape many of our habits internally, many of the forces that determine how we act as part of a society are determined by material reward, compensation of some kind, monetary or otherwise, for walking a particular path. It's this type of incentive that led to the development of economic incentive systems, which are, in essence, governments. Looked at in a certain way, every single government that has ever existed is just a collection of different incentives set up to cause people to behave in certain ways, judged to be the proper ways by those who set up these structures. This is what managers within corporations do too. They set and adjust incentives for the employees under their jurisdiction to try to get the optimal output based on the incentives that they, themselves, feel as part of a larger-scale incentive system that guides the behavior of managers. Follow this path all the way up the totem pole, and eventually we reach the interconnected network of societies that makes up the planet, all intertwined and in doing their best to provide incentives to other societies to get them to do things that are beneficial for their own interests. At the international level, these incentives could take the shape of trade deals, or tariff reductions on car parts. At the national level, it could be a decrease in taxes for certain industries, or a threatened increase in oversight within others. At the corporate level, incentives could look like raises or promotions or firings or performance reviews or honorary titles. At the familial and personal network level, it could mean cold shouldering someone or hanging out with one person more than another, or denying your partner affection when they do certain things, or rewarding your child with ice cream when they clean their room. At the individual level, incentives can feel like rage, or curiosity, or the intense desire to meet some new people because your loneliness is getting out of hand. Incentives are not a human invention. In biological terms, we are incentivized to do certain things, to behave in certain ways, by floods of chemicals, by the way certain acts make us feel. I think most of us understand intellectually that having kids is important to the propagation of the human species, but without biological incentives, the collection of love-related feelings, of hormones, of the pleasure of sex, the satisfaction of passing on our genetic heritage, the millions of gratifying moments found in raising a child, it's unlikely that as many people would put up with the countless downsides of child rearing without all those incentives. Having a kid is great. Many people will tell you that, but they feel that way because the incentives in having kids tend to outweigh those downsides. In this way, the creatures who are the most biologically incentivized to do things like reproduce and survive, and in the case of humans, to innovate and invent, those are the ones that are most likely to rise to the top of the ecological pyramid. But as we've evolved, we've also made incentives a key component to how human civilization operates. Rather than relying on how we feel biologically to guide our actions, we've put into place 
incentives to, for instance, produce enough crops to feed everyone. In the modern era, incentives are more likely to orientate around things like participating in a consumption-fueled capitalistic system, or in some parts of the world, in some levels of many bureaucratic hierarchies, to take what you can grab and to have as few scruples as possible. When you look out into the world and see people doing things that you perceive to be wrong, these acts can almost always be explained by the incentives they are operating under. People who do horrible things for money, the bankers who have collapsed entire economies, depleting the life savings of millions to line their own pockets, are acting in accordance with money and power-based incentives. There is good reason for them to want to be at the top of the pyramid, and they just happen to have the right kind of attitude and aptitude and sense of morality to take advantage of the many levers that society has offered them. Other people feel the same strain, the same drive to earn more money, to get more power, to become more respected and capable, but are either unable to act on these drives in the same way, or unwilling to do what needs to be done to quote-unquote succeed at that level according to the success metrics of that system. It's for this reason that you'll often hear economists in particular talking about incentives as a solution to the problems caused by our current system of incentives. If our existing selection of motivating factors are causing people to do things that are against the best interests of society, well, we should change those motivating factors. This logic is cyclical in a way, because the incentives they're replacing were at one point put into place to replace older, now outdated, incentives. But this logic is still potentially sound, very much like the logic of solving technological problems using more technology. Now, some would scoff and say that you can't do that. New systems, new tools, those will not solve the problems that old systems and tools have brought us. But that's not really true, if you think about it. Of course we need new systems and tools to solve those kinds of problems. What, are we just going to regress, step backward and backward and backward until we have no technology or infrastructure left? That would leave us with completely different problems, problems that our forebearers did everything they could to get away from. That's the kind of logic that looks great as an Instagrammable quote, but tends to fail the sniff test. And the idea that incentives cannot replace deteriorating incentives kind of works the same way. I would argue that new incentives are probably the only things that can sufficiently replace old incentives that have outlived their usefulness. But the unfortunate reality that we have to face is that any new incentives we instigate will almost certainly age badly as well. As much as communism and fascism and capitalism and feudalism and all the other governing systems we've ever set up have declared themselves to be the be-all end-all, the forever solution to all of society's ills, they are also quite flawed in different ways. And it's been a consistent fact throughout history that even a near-perfect system will demonstrate increased fragility over time for numerous different reasons. It's not because that system sucks, but because people who like to find loopholes and manipulate systems for personal gain or to further a cause they care about will do so. And people change. People's needs change. Their priorities change. So over time, even a seemingly be-all and all system will need more than just a new coat of paint. It'll likely need to be overhauled or completely replaced. In addition to often holding on to outdated incentives due to a fear of change, we also tend to fall prey to unintended consequences of incentives over a long enough timeline. It may, for instance, sound like a great idea to tax wealthy people less. After all, these are people who, theoretically, are more likely to invest that money that they save wisely and create assets and consequently create more jobs. Further, taxing the wealthy more than the non-wealthy would implicitly reduce the incentive for everyone to work harder to attain more wealth. After all, who wants to work themselves to death and earn a bunch of money only to be taxed more than their peers who probably don't work as hard? That seems like a disincentive to be productive, which is the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish. That is the theory behind so-called trickle-down economics, which has been seen in numerous places and in numerous shapes around the world over the years. 
but perhaps most famously in recent memory, in the tax cuts that were championed by former U.S. President Ronald Reagan, who based his system of tax incentives, which heavily favored the wealthy and corporations for the reasons I mentioned a moment ago, on the Laffer Curve, which is a bell curve-shaped graph that indicates that taxes can be too light or too heavy, which seems to imply that cutting taxes for high earners could, in fact, increase the overall amount of tax revenue that's generated because it would stimulate larger-scale economic growth. So fewer bigwigs would be paying out huge sums in the form of taxes, but more people overall will have more money to pay out in the form of taxes, so you'd make it up on scale. Unfortunately for Laffer Curve fans and the residents of Kansas who have, for years now, suffered under a similar state-centered set of tax cuts that have essentially bankrupted the region, this theory was somewhat sensible on paper but combusted as soon as it came into contact with harsh reality. In general, when wealthy people and corporations are given more money, in this case in the shape of tax deductions, they tend to save it and invest in assets that benefit themselves rather than their communities. So rather than amplifying overall growth for everyone, these tax deductions instead only increased the already wide gap between the haves and the have-nots. The unintended consequences of these types of tax breaks, then, have been astoundingly impactful and difficult to rein in. And in this case, there has been a secondary set of compounding consequences. When wealthy people and corporations have more resources to throw around due to those larger tax deductions, they also have an increased capability to influence elections and legislation. It's thought by many political analysts that the so-called health care bill that the Republican Party is currently trying to pass here in the U.S. as I record this episode is less about health care and more about finding ways to slash the budget so even bigger tax breaks can be given to the wealthy and the corporations. The single-mindedness with which they've pursued this goal has been astounding, and it indicates that a taste of those deductions has spurred a craving for more of them. And those who benefit most are those who are best positioned to make that happen within our current political system. So what happened as a result of those initial tax breaks was a situation in which those receiving the tax breaks were incentivized to throw their weight around to achieve more, bigger tax breaks. An unintended consequence leading to a new set of incentives, all of which are arguably negative for all but the fortunate wealthy few who benefit from these breaks. Again, here we have a situation in which well-intentioned incentives were put into place in an attempt to spur a positive outcome for everyone. But the unintended consequences of these incentives proved to be somewhat cataclysmic for certain elements of society. And it could be argued, some aspects of our political and economic system. I don't think any of these people who are angling for even greater tax cuts are evil or are intentionally trying to break the system. They're just acting in a way that seems rational to them, believing the world would be a better place if they and people just like them have more control and more resources, allowing them to reshape the world according to their standards. I do think that there are people in the world who would act differently, and there are people who are currently benefiting from these breaks, who invest their resources that they gain on societally beneficial things. But I also think it's true that few among us feel that our ideas and our sense of morality are inferior to those of others. And as such, we almost certainly feel that we should be the ones with more resources and power. Think of this situation from that perspective, of how you might throw your weight around, given the opportunity. And I think it makes this situation, but also the broader conversation about the power of incentives, a lot more comprehensible. One more point that I want to make about incentives is that they compel us to do things that, if we looked at them from different angles, we probably would not do. At a really fundamental level, for instance, capitalism incentivizes production. We need to earn money in order to survive. And I mean that word quite literally. You are nothing in a capitalistic society if you don't have money, to the point that you will be allowed to die 
by a pure version of that system, if you do not have the money to pay for food, shelter, medical care, and so on. That's the brutal reality of a system that, although much better than most other systems out there, I would argue is still super flawed. It's great at incentivizing us to make, because if we don't, we are dead. And if we do, we stand a chance of being able to do more of what we want more of the time. It also encourages us to pursue a particular brand of happiness and fulfillment that we are sold on in numerous different ways throughout our entire lives. But if we don't play ball, there are coercive incentives too, right alongside the remunerative ones. These incentives coalesce into an ethical system that makes things we otherwise wouldn't stand for okay. We might hurt someone else financially, take resources out of their pockets, if we can be sure those resources will be given to us. When we negotiate, we're really haggling over who keeps more resources, and succeeding in this regard is zero sum. Your gain is someone else's loss. It's okay to mislead people about the things they're buying, or to orchestrate a business deal that leaves the co-founder of a business you're selling out of the loop and out of the profits. It's just business after all, right? It's okay to kill someone else, so long as you are protecting your stuff from theft, or protecting your ideology, or physical manifestations of that ideology, at home or abroad, from those who have different ideas about things. We are incentivized to protect our system of incentives. I really don't want to harp too much on politics, but they do provide a wonderful illustration of how these things work in practice, and particularly how they work in the extremes. If you want to see the Olympic athletes of incentive chasing, look at Congress, look at your governor, look at the president. Paul Krugman, who's a professor of economics and a columnist for the New York Times, tweeted about the aforementioned Republican health care bill the other day. And in those tweets, he said, quote, The thing I keep returning to on the Senate bill is the contrast between the intense hardship it imposes and the triviality of the gains. Losing health insurance, especially if you're older, low income, and unhealthy, which are precisely the people hit, is a nightmare, and more than 20 million would face that nightmare. Meanwhile, the top 1% gets a tax cut. That cut is a lot of money, but because the 1% are already rich, it raises their after-tax income only 2%. Hardly life-changing. So vast suffering imposed to hand the rich a favor they'll barely even notice. How do we make sense of this, politically or morally? End quote. I spoke a little about taxes, and in particular dodging taxes using loopholes in an earlier episode. And my conclusion was that, in essence, if the loopholes are there and you are a rational person, why would you not avoid paying them? To many people, if the choice is between having a group of bureaucrats spend your money on missiles and $3,000 toilet seats for some politician's private bathroom, or you spending that money on whatever you like, well, of course you'd choose the latter. That same concept extends here, though in a slightly different way. The entire point of this healthcare bill, which some are calling a wealthcare bill, because not a single healthcare entity believes it will be any good for anyone, health-wise, seems to be to give those tax cuts to wealthy people. That's the entire point of this bill. It's predicated on the idea that these politicians can do this. They can pass such a bill for good reasons or no reason at all. So why wouldn't they? And the sad fact of the matter is that that's kind of true. These people are in a position of power, and that power allows them to do this. So if they're able to pass a health care bill that seems to do very little except to take away health care from tens of millions of people, and in exchange it will give a small but significant tax cut to the wealthiest members of society, which includes them and their friends, well, why wouldn't they do that? If we remove things like subjective moral values from the equation, or put into better context for this conversation, if we remove the coercive social incentives provided by things like reputation or shame, lacking those bulwarks against corruption, the political system of which these people are a part seems to be incentivizing them 
to do things just like this, to pass exactly this type of bill. Now, traditionally, things like pork barrel add-ons to bills, meaning the brazen handouts that politicians would add to the bills that they are presenting in order to get other politicians to support it, are what have incentivized collaboration and cooperation between parties and interests. And as a result, the embarrassing line-item earmark of a few million dollars to repair roads in Rhode Island added on to a bill intended to provide funding for science education for the underprivileged in Kentucky was kind of a necessary evil. It was the grease that kept the system moving and the dollars going mostly where they needed to go. It's not something you wanted anyone to notice on your hands, and it's not something you wanted people talking about, but it was somewhat required to keep the machine operating smoothly. Today, the system has become more about the grease and less about the machine that it's supposed to keep in good repair. A healthcare bill has become more about the pork than the healthcare, and the incentives that previously kept something like this from happening, namely the fear that the public would become aware of where the money is going and who it's benefiting and who it's victimizing in the trade off, they've largely disappeared. And there are a lot of possible reasons for this some of which revolve around the current state of politics and the next levelness of our current president's disdain for business as usual, when the leader of our country has no shame, meaning he cannot be shamed, cannot be kept in line by coercive social norms and the disapproval of his countrymen, then one of the main levers in the system, one of the main incentives for politicians to at least mostly walk a straight line, to do things that generally align with the interests of the nation as a whole, rather than just themselves, it kind of disappears. Or said another way, why wouldn't Republicans try to grab whatever they can for themselves and for their friends when the incentive not to do so is no longer compelling for them? I really don't want to make it seem like it's only Republicans who are doing this kind of thing, but a lot of the biggest, most prominent examples right now are unfortunately coming from their camp. Part of that might be is that they do hold the majority of the power right now, and if Democrats end up taking back a great deal of power in 2018, we may see that dynamic flipping, and I'll be talking more shit about them. But as it is, this is the situation, and unfortunately the Republicans are teaching the United States a masterclass on what it looks like when traditional incentives no longer keep people walking the intended path. Our current slate of political systems is just one example of incentives that generally work until we figure out a way to game them. Over time, people figure out how to optimize their actions for the metrics that are actually being measured and rewarded rather than for the intended outcomes of that measurement. If we reward people who can get folks riled up and who make for good television instead of people who show a knack for governance, well, then we're going to get the former as our politicians. If we reward the ability to earn money rather than the ability to create value, then we're going to create a version of capitalism that favors the wealthy however they manage to attain their fortune rather than the people who actually create valuable things. If we reward the ability to take tests, rather than the ability to learn things and derive conclusions from that learned information, we're going to end up with an education system that's great for measuring test-taking capabilities, but not so great for stimulating actual cognitive growth. Incentives shape a great deal of what's happening around us, and it's a good idea to understand them, not just so you can see the strings that are controlling your actions, but so you can better imagine what a more ideal setup might look like, and what strings you might need to help put into place to make that reality happen. So as I mentioned in the intro, I'm not going to do any other sponsored messages today. I'm just going to focus on direct contribution, and the easiest way to do that is to go to the Patreon for this podcast, and that's at patreon.com slash let's know things. And there are multiple benefits to doing so. If you are a contributor on Patreon, you get an ad-free version of the show. 
You also get other benefits depending on which tier you contribute at, how much you contribute each month. But to me, one of the better things, and hopefully it will be an increasingly wonderful thing about having that page, is that it's also a community where we can have discussions about some of these topics that I'm talking about here on the podcast. So it's a nice way to not just broadcast these types of topics and to have these types of discussions one way, but to actually put it out there and then allow people to comment back, to share their thoughts, to share their ideas, to share concepts that they think make for interesting episodes. And that's already happening to a certain degree. It's still a relatively small community over there, but it will just get better and better as more people join in. So contributing on Patreon is a great way to help support this show, but it's also a great way to connect with other people, like-minded individuals, people who are open to having these types of discussions and want to learn more from each other. A huge thanks to everyone who's already contributing on Patreon or elsewhere. That means a great deal to me. Thank you. And a thank you in advance if you are considering doing so in the future. Patreon.com slash Let's Know Things. Now, usually at this point in the show, I recommend a book. Today, I wanted to recommend something a little bit different. It is still a piece of writing, mostly at least. It's a work of science fiction, but it's kind of sports-related as well. It's published on SBNation.com, which is Vox Media's sports page. And I'm not a sports guy. It's not something I tend to read about very often. So I was just as surprised to find myself there as anyone. But this work of fiction, which is entitled 17,776, that's the numbers 17776, and written by John Boys, is about football in the year 17,776. So a long ways in the future. And telling you much more than that will give away too many important plot points, I think. But I will say that this is a story that is told from some very unusual narrators using a somewhat unusual format, and it's told in text and in some interesting images and through some short videos. And they're all put in order, so you'll know exactly what to click when, what to read when, what to view when. And if you've never engaged with non-standard fiction before, anything unusual like fiction in the form of a video game or flash fiction or fiction on Twitter, this is a great entry point because it is presented in a really attainable way. You don't have to know anything special to to check it out. And it is just hilarious and fun and interesting and bizarre. It was totally unexpected for me and such a delight to take in. It is also free. So I will link to this in the show notes, or you can do a Google search for 17776 by John Boys. It's at SBNation.com. I do hope you enjoy it. I certainly did. You can find out more about me and the work that I do at Colin.io. You can find my blog at ExileLifestyle.com. And you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode at Let's Know Things.com. You can find me pretty much everywhere on the internet at Colin is my name. Feel free to say howdy. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Thank you.